three, two, one, go. Police search warrant, police! I'm right, I'm left, I got left. Give me two, give me two. Go. Clear right! Clear up here, clear left. As you can see, it's pretty intense. You would not want to be on the opposite side of that door um, when these guys were, were coming through. Okay, what are your demands? I want $30,000 and a helicopter ride to Mexico. I've killed before. I'm not afraid to do it again. I will shoot to kill police officers on site. Police are trained to respond to every call with urgency. But when the caller is lying, like in the 911 recording we just heard, law enforcement becomes a pawn in a dangerous and expensive hoax. Swatting relies on simple and widely available technology to disguise a caller's identity. Disposable cell phones, internet call services, and even number disguising apps make it increasingly difficult for police to track down these pranksters. You're gonna give me this fucking money. People are gonna fucking die if you don't. That is all I have to say. Good motherfucking bye. Somerset is one of the wealthiest counties in the U.S. It has great schools, a low crime rate, and like a growing number of police forces throughout the country, a souped up special weapons and tactics force, or SWAT team, just in case. Beginning with the war on drugs and after national tragedies like Columbine and 9-11, the U.S. has seen a surge in militarization and funding of SWAT teams in counties large and small. Over the last decade, the Department of Homeland Security alone has given away $35 billion in grants to state and local police. We went to spend the day with the Somerset County SWAT team at their Emergency Services Training Academy to see where that money was going. For the headshot, you're looking for eyes and nose. That's your target area. We apply for every grant. If there's a grant and we can get money for it, we'll apply for it. So uh, we, we've applied Homeland Security money. Uh, we'll show you the uh, Lenco Bear, our, uh, our uh, armored assault rescue vehicle. Infrared cameras and um, pole cameras and shields and stuff like that. We get a lot of that with grant money. Bear we use on every call out. Um, really? The Bear, yes. Uh, I think it stands for Ballistic Engineered Assault Rescue Vehicle. Lenco company up in Pittsfield, Massachusetts uh, designs it. There it is right there. Damn. Uh, it's roughly a $400,000 machine. Uh, we never would have been able to make that purchase if we didn't apply for Homeland Security money. Don't call me, I think in the area of uh, the high 50s, this one cost, and again, it was purchased through grant money. What do we use this for? Is this sort of to, uh, you know, for a bomb situation, for a hazard situation? Could, could be for, right, if we feel there's a threat of, of a bomb, could be for uh, exposure to chemicals or some sort of gas that could hurt us. It could be just because somebody may want to shoot at us and we absolutely know they want to shoot at us so we could send this in and uh, it could deal with the situation and we don't expose our, our officers to uh, undue risk. 20 years ago, we were running around with Radio Shack walkie-talkies because that's all we could afford. There was no money for this type of operation around here. Are you sure you just got last year? Have you had to use it for any intense situations yet, or no? Not really. Not yet. Yeah, right? Nothing big. Nothing major. Aside from Homeland Security grants that encourage local police departments to buy military-grade hardware for their own SWAT units, the U.S. government has for years given away this technology for free to combat the war on drugs and domestic terrorism. I'm amazed at like, the, the kids here, man. They are... No joke, like they're serious stuff. Yeah, a, a U.S. Department of Defense program, often called the Pentagon Pipeline, has redistributed billions of dollars worth of surplus military gear over the last two decades to local police forces. Much of it repurposed from wars overseas. All right, so the next course of fire is going to be two in the upper chest, then one in the head. Two in the upper chest, one in the head. We've just seen a lot of heavily armed uh, members of the SWAT team. You can see they are kitted out, and they look like they're, uh, they're ready for war. So it's pretty reassuring if you're going to be involved in a violent confrontation, I'm sure, in the surrounding area but it doesn't sound like there are too many violent confrontations um, in Somerset County. 
SWAT teams were originally formed to handle violent civil unrest, shootouts, and hostage rescues. But with increased access to paramilitary equipment, the U.S. has seen a dramatic rise in the use of these tactics for low-risk warrants and non-violent drug raids as well. It's estimated the number of raids conducted by SWAT teams has gone from 3,000 a year in the 1980s to over 50,000 raids a year today. We can't be sure, as most states don't even disclose the frequency with which they deploy these forces. This lack of transparency is currently under investigation by the ACLU, which is trying to find out how often police use war tactics and weaponry in American neighborhoods, and to what extent federal funding is incentivizing this trend. All SWATter needs is a way to hide their phone number, a victim's address, and a crazy story to tell the police. We're at NYU School of Computer Science and Engineering to find out just how easy that is. Justin Capos is a professor of computer science and engineering at NYU and an expert in cybersecurity. So we've got 12-year-olds that are basically pulling off the SWATting maneuver. Um, how easy is it to do this? In terms of technical knowledge, there isn't a substantial amount of information someone needs to have. They just sort of need to stumble to the right parts of the internet, to the dark sides of the internet, and get the right sorts of tools, and then they can do this rather easily. Is there a type in the hacking community that people sort of point out as the, as the cliched person that does this sort of swatting thing? Yes, uh, a lot of times it's, it's people who are rather young, who are um, maybe don't have the same sort of mental and emotional development that many of us get later on in life and so they kind of don't know the the lines between right and wrong quite as well so it's it's often what we in the hacker community term script kiddies that do this kind of stuff so they know only a few things they know a few sites they've been to and they've kind of learned hey this is a fun little thing i can try to do and they're kind of unaware of the consequences of sending you know 30 or so uh, heavily armed police officers to to someone's house to break down the door in Los Angeles, it's known as swatting, and it's become an alarming trend. Swatting pranks have been used on some of the biggest names in Hollywood. Swatting began to attract national media attention when celebrities became victims. There is breaking news happening at the Kardashian house. And it's happening more and more. Last week, Rihanna and Sean Combs were targeted. Before them, Tom Cruise, Charlie Sheen, and Miley Cyrus. All fake incidents prompting massive responses. Aside from sending out a bunch of well-armed officers into innocent people's homes, swatting can cost tens of thousands of dollars. A fact not lost on California State Senator Ted Lieu, a victim of swatting himself. I was at a meeting in Orange County and I got a call on my cell phone uh, from a police officer in Torrance who said, you know, is this Ted Lieu? And I said, yes. And he said, um, where are you? And I said, I'm in Orange County. And he goes, Okay, so you didn't just kill your wife in your home. I said, no, I did not. And he said, well, we got a call that you did, and we're sending multiple police cars uh, to your home right now. I hung up and tried calling my wife, letting her know that this was happening, and then I couldn't reach her. But by that time, police force already showed up, and there were people with uh, rifles going through our home. You had fire trucks, you had paramedics. It was a very large response. But she also knew I was carrying a bill on swatting, so I think part of her was thinking, I wonder if this is related to that and someone decided to, you know, swat her house. Celebrity swatting occurred with such frequency in California that the LAPD stopped publicly reporting these incidents for fear of copycats. Senator Liu introduced legislation this year making swatters liable for the full cost of fake SWAT team raids, which can amount to tens of thousands of dollars. The reason swatting calls result in massive police responses uh, is because the 911 operator often cannot tell if it's real or fake, and they have to assume it's real. Uh, swatting is dangerous in a number of ways. First of all, it drains law enforcement and firefighter resources. And so they're responding to one swatting call, or maybe more than one, that means they can't be responding to real emergencies. It's also dangerous because the actual incident is very tense for the people who respond. They're under the impression people are dying 
at that home or whatever their place is. And imagine if it's dark at night and they all show up with their guns drawn, you could see a miscommunication result in death or injury uh, very easily. Despite the national attention, celebrities are not the only victims of swatting. Far more often, it's regular families. So we're in Long Beach, Long Island right now, where in April, Jose Castillo and his family were swatted after Jose's little brother beat somebody in a Call of Duty video game and he prank called the police. Now, half the town's police force, SWAT team, helicopter, and medical personnel all showed up at Jose's doorstep because they were told that his little brother killed Jose and his mother. We're gonna go talk to Jose and see how it feels on the other side of swatting. This is a high stakes, high danger prank. Celebrity homes have been hit by it and now some innocent victims in the news in suburban New York, inside their own home. My little brother was playing his Xbox 360 or whichever it was he was using. He told me there was someone on the other side of the, of the microphone, you know, in a party chat telling that he was gonna call the police, that he was gonna swat him and he used the term swatting? Yeah, he used the term swatting. He was like, I'm gonna swat you. And my little brother was like, uh, Jose, someone is telling me he's gonna swat me. And I told him, get off the game. Jose went out and returned a couple of hours later to find his street closed off and his house surrounded by police and emergency responders. So what were you seeing? You were seeing just like police all in this yeah. area? Yeah, I thought it was a fire or something, you know, maybe my neighbor's house. And then I see my mom getting carried away by like two police officers. Uh, I just um, I approached the first officer that led me through the perimeter and I asked him, like, what's going on? He told me someone inside of the red house shot and killed his, his mother and, and brother. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, I'm like, what are you talking about? How can, how can anybody be dead in the house? There's only three people live there and it's me, my mom, and my little brother. And I'm right here and she's over there. So I'm sitting there like, uh, can I like speak to like your supervisor or someone? <laughs> can I speak to someone that can like listen to me right now? And yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. so at this point you're talking to the officers, uh, you're trying to figure out what's happening. At what point do you kind of does it kind of click in your head that maybe this is related to that that threat that you got earlier? Um, once I saw the SWAT team come in, actually like getting ready, putting in the, all their uniforms, and at this point my little brother is still inside of the house and he doesn't know what's going on. And I kept telling the police, look, I seen this in the news, this is a joke. And, you know. Nothing. And no matter what, they can't stop the process? Like, I don't understand. Yeah, they, they, so th 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 what they told us is they have to make sure that there's nothing going on. So they had to actually go in and I wish they would have listened to us a little more, but yeah. you know, they have to do what they have to do. You think your little brother's gonna play Call of Duty again after this? Nah. Never? Nah. <laughs> He's done. Online video games are just one of the means by which swatters can easily get personal information used to prank their victims. Once obtained, it's even easier to place calls anonymously. What about in terms of, of law enforcement actually catching the people that, that are doing this? You see every now and then, you know, a 16-year-old will get busted here, or a 15-year-old there. Um, they're having a really hard time catching these people, huh? They, they do have a hard time catching people in general with it because people who have been doing this now, they sort of know, uh, well, the way that we need to do it is we need to disguise where this call's coming from. The hacker economy is, is very much that, an economy. And so there are people there who are willing to sell kind of pre-built malware and pre-built boxes that do certain malicious things that really you only have to click a box or you download software and click a button and it's, it's ready to go. And this is just sort of actually a small front in this battle between good hackers, bad hackers, law enforcement that just doesn't seem like it's ever going to stop. It, it's very difficult, especially for the good guys, because... If you're doing defense, you have to kind of protect everything and you have to protect it against sort of all possible ways somebody can get in. If you're an attacker, then you just have to find one thing that they've kind of forgotten about or maybe multiple things and find a way to chain them together into what you want to do. Despite the abundant resources for tactical gear, the real problem facing law enforcement is that most departments don't have experts trained in cybersecurity to help police analyze and track down fraudulent 911 calls. There's a potential now for an increase in false reports. And I'm sure, you know, every time you guys get these calls, you're wired up, you're good to go. Uh, do you think if, if there's a lot of these, is it going to change how you guys respond to certain calls? I, I think our response protocol is going to have to be uh, tightened up, tweaked a little bit. I'm hoping maybe legislation on either the state or national level 
uh, and focusing on this uh, from an investigative and prosecutorial standpoint will uh, will uh, help to uh, abate it and cause it to stop. But if it doesn't, yeah, we're certainly going to have to look at the way we respond, the way we dispatch our team, uh, maybe a little closer analysis of the initial call when it comes in to make sure it's a real call. They're going to have to really analyze that call and, and maybe put devices in place to say, uh, um, is this a real job or is this a case of swatting, which uh, I, I hope stops. You know, you guys, you guys are, are like a machine. Like we've seen the way you guys move, the way you fire. Everyone here is trained top notch. Some people might look at this and look at Somerset County and say, is all this necessary? I mean, you guys have, you know, the, these robots and these tanks and whatever and, and like top notch kits. Uh, and they might look at it and say, you know, do we really need this in suburban New Jersey? How would you address those people? I would ask somebody that, uh, that, that maybe suffered a loss uh, because of not having this service. And, and, and I would focus on them and ask them to answer that question. I would say, well, you know, a SWAT team wasn't available when you really needed it, or a police officer wasn't available when you really needed it, or an ambulance didn't get there when you really needed it, and uh, what happened, and uh, how, do, how does that make you feel? And if your child was in a school that was suddenly uh, under attack by uh, some random actors, uh, do you want them coming to help your kid, or, uh, or do you want no one to show up? That's what I would say to them. In an age where a teenager with a cell phone can incite chaos, there is no doubt authorities need to re-examine their strategy in combating technology with brute force. Who knows what could happen if people start using these methods with more malicious intentions than just pranks.